Hello, my name is Homer Knox and I'm with MenTeachingMen.com. I'm at the Life Center in Bradenton, Florida. The Life Center is a Christian residential discipleship program and I'm always glad to be working with the men. <laughs> Tonight we're going to be teaching on the Gospel of Mark chapter 10. It's just a great book of the Bible. Um, the lessons that I'm going to have, there's an outline on my lessons on the MenTeachingMen.com <laughs> website and you can download that and use that for God's glory if you'd so like. I'm going to be using the New American Standard Bible for our translation references tonight. Well, we're talking about uh, Mark chapter 10. Um, Mark is an action gospel, a lot of action happening in this gospel. And Jesus is God's servant doing God's will. And Jesus is a man of action. We're going to see a whole bunch of action in this chapter. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Vernon McGee. I've used some of his radio Bible teachings, giving me new ideas on that, so I appreciate that. He's gone to be with the Lord, but we'll give him uh, uh, the due for, for, for helping me on this. In chapter 9, let's back up a chapter. We saw the transfiguration of Jesus. We saw John the Baptist. He was signified as Elijah. We saw prayer needed for healing powers. And Jesus uh, discusses his death. The apostles unbelievably argue who is greatest. Jesus encourages alternative ministries that are out of the norm, not doctrinally, but out of the norm. And uh, he talked about removing hindrances from your life. That's chapter 9. Chapter 10, in verse 10, 1, it says, and this is again the New American Standard Bible, and rising up, he went from there to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered around him, and according to his custom, he once more began to teach them. He went to the region of Judea. Where was he before? He was up in Galilee, Lake of Galilee, and he's coming down now, and he's going to go into Jerusalem. And it says, crowds gathered around him, and he, once, he began to teach them. Jesus' lifestyle was one of ministry. Wherever he went, whatever he did, he ministered to people. And um, Jesus is moving from Galilee, uh, coming into Judea, and finally he's going to be into Jerusalem for his death and resurrection during Passover. Verse 2, some Pharisees came up to him testing him and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce a wife. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And that's in Deuteronomy 24, chapter, verse 1. But Jesus said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Well, this is a trick question, because whichever way Jesus answers it, he's going to be in bad here. And so, if he answers no, he contradicts Moses. Now you remember John the Baptist, he said you're not allowed to divorce and you're not allowed to marry somebody else's wife and what happened to him? Well, he was beheaded for that. And the reason it says that Moses allowed for divorce was in the hardness of their heart. Our first response on any big questions in our life should be, what does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? And Jesus does that over and over in his teaching. He says, what does the word say? What does the word say? In verse 10, and in the house the disciples began questioning him about this again. It's interesting that they didn't get it the first time that they questioned him again. I thought that was really interesting. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. Divorce is a really difficult question. Uh, divorce is sin, divorce is sin, and divorce is sin, okay? But it's forgivable. It's forgivable. My background denomination is the Brother in Christ Church. I got saved in the Brother in Christ Church. And they have a position on divorce. And here's what they say. If you can't live together, and there's people that just can't live together, they'll kill each other, separate. But they won't recommend divorce. They'll say separate. And there are many pastors out there that will not marry a divorced person. They just won't. There are also biblical reasons for divorce. 
And one of those is called adultery. If you commit adultery against your spouse, the spouse is able to divorce you. And that's called the Pauline, under, after the Apostle Paul, the Pauline escape. We had a man here in the program that approached me and said, hey, my wife is doing this, my wife is doing that, my wife is doing this. And he said, I'm, go I'm going to divorce her. I wanted to know what I thought. Well, what I thought was, don't divorce her, just wait. Just wait. See how it all plays out. There was an evangelist who had children, and his wife went around and he would evangelize, and, and she got the Las Vegas thing in her heart, and she wanted to go to Las Vegas to be a dancer. And so she left him. And he said, he started to pray that. I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, I can't, I can't have this. And God said to him, just wait. And so that's what he did. And she was killed in a, she got a cab to go somewhere, and a, and a car went through a red light and slammed in and would kill her. Well, what's happened with that is now he's not divorced, is he? Now he's a widower. And in the church's eyes, especially for somebody that ministers, that's a big thing. That's a big thing. Verse 13, and they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was what? He was indignant, wasn't he? He was just indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them. For the, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands upon them. Receive the kingdom like a child. Isn't that how we come to Christ as a child? We open up our heart. We open up our heart. And hindering children in any way from coming to Jesus is harmful to them and harmful to you. It's interesting that he mentions the children coming to him right after divorce. Interesting. Uh, we know that children pay the price for divorce, don't we? They pay the price. Uh, the position of not introducing small children to Jesus and say, well, I'll wait till they get older and they can make up their mind is always bad. Children at a tender age, age are more agreeable, more understanding of Jesus. And uh, it says that Jesus took the children up in his arms. I don't remember reading any other place in the scriptures where he took people in his arms. Verse 17, And as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him, ran up, and began asking him, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. And he said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess, and give it to the poor, and you should have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But at these words his face fell. He went away grieved, for he was one who owned much property. Well, we have another question for Jesus. And what does Jesus do again? He points him to the scriptures, doesn't he? Jesus points to the scriptures again to answer this man. Uh, Jesus points to the commandments that involve relationship with men. Look at these. Do not murder, that involves men. Do not commit adultery, men. Do not steal, men. Do not bear false witness, men. Do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And that's relationships with people. Murder, adultery, stealing, lying. One thing you lack, your relationship with God. And money was wealth was holding him back, this guy. This guy is supposedly Barnabas. He reads, you read about him at, at the, at later on in the New Testament. It seems to me that Jesus is calling this guy into ministry, come and follow me. Maybe an apostle replacing Judas when <clears throat> Judas was gone? I don't remember another place in Scripture where Jesus invites somebody into his ministry other than the initial calling of the apostles. I don't remember another place like that. Verse 23, And Jesus looking around says to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man 
to enter the kingdom of God. And they were even more astonished and said to them, Then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. All things are possible. A wonderful verse to memorize, man. A wonderful verse. Well, Jesus is giving a warning on wealth here, isn't he? Um, you need to put the money concerns in your life not as your first priority in life. That's sometimes hard to do, but that should not be your first priority. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is what? The root of all evil. The root of all evil. Absolutely right. Do you know what the eye of the needle is? Gate. Difficult, a gate. Difficult for a camel to go through the eye needle. It's a round gate. It's a round gate. And camels would have to get way down to go through. All things are possible. That's a theme through the entire scriptures. Verse 28, Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he shall receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses, brothers, sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Uh, it says here farms. I, I'm out of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and there's farms all over the place, big farms, and there's tons of them. And that farm thing to men, that owning land, is a big thing. You know, that's a big thing. And no matter what happens, they always say, don't sell the farm, keep that keep that. And there's a ton of missionaries that have gone out from Lancaster County that have left go of the farm and say, hey, I want to serve Jesus more than a farm. It's kind of like a rancher. They make a big deal on that land. It is a big deal to have that land. And so uh, he uses that here, which I think is real interesting. Okay, receive a hundred times as much in verse 30 in the present age, houses, brothers, sisters, children and farms, along with persecution. In the age to come, but many of first will be last. Um, now in this present age, they'll have rewards, but they will have more rewards when they get to heaven, won't they? They'll have all those things replaced. Um, <coughs> since your persecutions, when you start working for the Lord, you're going to get persecuted. Okay? You can talk to our pastors here. You can talk to our pastors here, and and they will tell you about persecution. They had a home. They bought a home up in the Arts District up in Bradenton North here. And uh, they had a heck of a time with that. It was a nice home too. It was really nice. The guys fixed it all up. But they had a real problem with that with the people giving them trouble on that. And finally they sold it. They came back here. Well they were here before but it was an additional home. Verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. Why is that? Because the apostles knew what was going to happen. Jesus has been teaching them what's going to happen. That Jesus is going to suffer. He's going to be killed. And they knew that. And Jesus is following through. He's way ahead of them. They're behind. And they were amazed. They were amazed that he was doing that. And those who followed were fearful. I can understand that, can't you? It's the end. It's the end. And he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. This is about the third or fourth time that he's done this. Saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, they will spit on him, they will scourge him, and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. He's good. They were fearful. I guess they were. You, all, you guys all understand what scourging is? Scourging, they take a rope. And you know how it frays out at the end? You know, you can fray it out. You can unwind a little bit at the end and frays. And they put stone and glass in there. Okay? And then they whip you with it. Wow. And so they hit you, and that stone and glass embeds in your back, and they pull it out, and then it just rips skin. Yeah. And uh, they do that scourging. They scourge him. It, what it does is it makes you bleed. You bleed big time. So when Jesus, when Je they were done with Jesus, the scripture says that if you, did, if you didn't know him before, you wouldn't know him at the end. Because they just beat the crap out of him. They just beat the crap out of him. 
They were amazed. He was ahead. Verse 35, And Jesus and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to him, saying to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant that we may sit in your glory, one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, Yes, we are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Well, we're having a power grab here, aren't we? We're having a power grab eternity. And here's what Jesus says, Are you able to drink the cup? What's he talking about? It's the cup of suffering. It's the cup of torture. It's the cup of death. And John lived out his life. He was tortured, but James was killed. And that's what he's saying. Are you able to drink, go through the baptism? Jesus had a baptism of punishment. Uh, Jesus uh, <coughs> says to them, this is in, I like this here. <coughs> they said, I want to be on your right and your left. And Jesus says to them, uh, are you able to drink the cup? Jesus doesn't say yes or no, does he? He lets them respond what they want. He said, I want you to do something for us, and he lets them go then. Uh, my wife does that to me. She says, will you help me? Well, it depends what she wants. If she wants to rob a bank, I'm not going to help her, am I? You know, I'm not going to, you know, she, she's not going to ask that. But the point is, you always want to be careful when, when uh, someone asks you something to do something for you and doesn't tell you what it is, right? You can be in trouble doing that. And so I always say the same thing. Well, what is it? And then I know. Make sense? It's something that's helped me. All right, we know that heaven is free. It's a free place. But for your place in heaven, you will have a place in, in heaven. It says we will rule and reign. You'll have a place in heaven. That requires work. That requires work here. Verse 41, And hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. I guess so, didn't they? And calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is teaching humbleness here again, isn't he? It's one of his themes he's trying to work with his apostles on, humbleness, humbleness. Verse 46, And they came to Jericho, and as he was going out from Jericho with his disciples, and a great multitude, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard it was Jesus, of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more. When you're crying out to God, don't let anybody try to stop you. Don't allow your cries and your prayers to God to be stopped. You keep crying out. You keep crying out more. And that's what this guy did. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, arise, he is calling you. I can guarantee you that many of you men in this house are called to work for God in many ways. I can tell you that you're called to live a life of righteousness. I can, tell, I can tell you that some of you men are called to teach. Some of you men are called to preach. Some of you men are called to be street evangelists. God has a calling for each of you. And one of your tasks, which should be as you grow closer to Jesus, is to find out what your calling is. Does that make sense? Verse 50, And casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Casting aside the cloak is disregarding the disability that he has. He's casting it off. He's casting it off. And I'll tell you where you see this. If you watch Healing Evangelist, if you get a chance to watch them on TV, here's what they say. Throw that, throw that cane down. Get rid of that. 
you know, he'll say, get rid of that wheelchair, get up here. You know, they're casting that infirmity away. 51, in answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to them, go away, your faith has made you well. I just love Jesus as he heals it, like boom, just like this. Doesn't fool around. Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following Jesus on the road. I love that. He heals men and then he, they follow him. I just love it. A lot of men here, they heal, or women that he heal, I guess both, that don't follow him. They go other places. Well, he said in verse 48, Keep crying all the more. Don't stop crying out to God for what, for what you want. Don't allow others to stop or discourage you. We talked about casting the coat. Indicates casting out sickness. Touched. Had faith for healing. Begin following him. I love this. Uh, we don't see this often in scriptures. Uh, Raboni is used twice in the scriptures. Here and in John 20.16. Well, let's do a summary of chapter 10. Jesus continues his daily ministry. does the same thing each day. He heals. He touches. Uh, the Pharisees are testing Jesus again. How many times have they done this in the book of Mark? Over and over and over again. Jesus talks about the legality of divorce. Uh, he declares divorce sin. Uh, disciples were hindering children from coming to Jesus. And Jesus was indignant. It doesn't use that word a lot about Jesus, but he does get indignant about children. Rich man declines the participation in the ministry, and Jesus warns of the dangers of wealth. Jesus again discusses his death again, and we see an attempted power grab by James and John. Jesus then talks again about servanthood, and finally, he heals Barabbas. He heals Barabbas. That is chapter 10. Uh, you know, again, we see in this chapter that Jesus' love for individuals that he has. No matter what he's doing, he takes the time to help individuals and to minister where he was. And, and I'm so thankful that, that our Savior, who runs a big universe, cares about us. He cares about us individually. And he'll help us in our time of need. And so, what a wonderful Savior. Jesus is a wonderful God. And so, we thank him. Hello friends, this is Homer Knox again. I hope you enjoyed this video teaching. The question I have for you is, is your name written in the book of life? Are you born again? And are your sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ? Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He suffered and died under Pontius Pilate and the Romans. He was buried for three days and three nights. And he rose from the dead in power. And he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, according to the scriptures. There is salvation in no one else. If you have not done so, now, now is the time to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Or if you have walked away from this salvation and want to have your name rewritten in the book of life, please pray with me. Dear Jesus, I accept you as my personal Savior. Come into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to cleanse me with your precious blood. Thank you for giving me this salvation. Thank you for making me a new person, and thank you for the Holy Spirit now living inside of me. Amen and amen. If you prayed this prayer from your heart for the first time, you're now born again, you're saved, you're a part of the Christian family. Praise God. Welcome, welcome. If you prayed this prayer after slipping away, congratulations. You're back in the kingdom. You're back in the fold. There's another teaching on the menteachingmen.com website entitled, I Just Got Saved, Now What? And that video will help you on your new walk with Jesus Christ. Also, there are other videos on the Men Teaching Men website which would help you in your daily walk. God bless you.